Welcome to another episode of the podcast that discusses all related issues for the older workers in the workplace and when job seeking or even hiring. Today, we are joined by Richard Sumner, the owner of Spreadsheet Solutions, who is originally from South Africa, but now lives in Bromley with his wife and young son. His company creates custom spreadsheets for all applications and businesses, serving clients throughout the UK and other parts of the world, with purpose-built spreadsheets to cover all applications, not just finance, for businesses of all shapes and sizes. He has combined his business knowledge and Excel skills to create some amazing spreadsheets to help businesses overcome all sorts of hurdles. Richard has also recently written a book called 40 Facets of Starting and Growing a Business, which is definitely worth a read as he goes into detail covering everything you need to know about starting a business and he covers all the lessons and pitfalls he learnt along the way. Refreshingly, it's not a book to teach you how to be successful, but more of a reference book written specifically in mind to detail everything you need to think about when embarking on your new adventure. He also offers plenty of free resources on his website with a special free offer to followers of the Age Diversity Network. So keep listening for further info. So Richard, um, thanks very much for joining us. And you are the owner of Spreadsheet Solutions. Um, j- just for the, for the listeners, can you just explain what Spreadsheet Solutions actually does? Yes, um, it's, it's a company that makes spreadsheets for businesses essentially. But what I think I do differently is a lot of people when they hear the word spreadsheet, they automatically assume finances. Uh, whereas I do financial spreadsheets, but I find that my background is more in project management than, than finances. So I'm I'm looking at more kind of CRM, project management process, tracking data analysis, that kind of thing. But yeah, I, I make uh, custom purpose-built spreadsheets for, for businesses of all shapes and sizes. Okay, and, and you've spent a long time in IT, haven't you? So is is, is that something that, that you fell into or was it just something that, that you decided, actually, I've got a, a bit of a niche here um, and I can see a, there's a requirement out there. So uh, is, is that what drove you to that or, or was it just something that, that you fell into? Well, to be honest with you, um, I have always been involved in IT, um, but not necessarily for the sake of IT. I've, I've been involved in a lot of project management backgrounds, as, as I said, but a lot of them have even been in the trades. Yeah. Uh, so I'm um, in, in South Africa back in, in the day when I started working, you had all these requirements that you had to do, but there were, there were very few software programs available. So I was often stuck in a situation where my boss would say to me, we need to manage what's happening. We have no software. Here's Excel, knock yourself out. And, and, that, and I would often have to make solutions like that in Excel. So I think, although I've been in various different jobs throughout my career, and various different industries, the one thing that stayed in common has been making solutions in Excel to do the work that we needed to do. And that eventually just uh, developed into, into my passion. So I think uh, spreadsheets, certainly I've used them over the last, I wouldn't like to say how many years, and they, they definitely have a, a place. Would, you, would it be fair to say that a spreadsheet solution, uh, possibly the wrong term to use, but is a, is a poor man's solution because there are so many bits of software out there that have so much functionality and can cost thousands and thousands, whereas maybe a spreadsheet for the solution they're actually trying to um, overcome, a spreadsheet solution would actually do that job for them. Yes and no. I think yes, in the sense where is there software available or can software be made? Yes, I would say most of the spreadsheets I make, if you've got a software developer to make the same thing, they could do it. The question is, as you, as you rightly point out, is what would the cost be? Um, I've had clients of mine take a spreadsheet that costs three figures and taken it to a software developer and all of a sudden it's come out of five figures. And when I say five, I mean high five figures. So. You, yes, there is, an, there is an opportunity to make spreadsheets for a much more affordable price than, than custom software that does the same thing. But I think sometimes they, they really, I mean, uh, using, using custom software in certain cases is like taking a gun to a knife fight. Uh, it really is overkill. 
Um, but then there are the situations where people just can't afford the software and they come to me. So yes, it could be a kind of poor man solution for bespoke software, but then there are other times where actually Excel is actually a, a better option than using software anyway, in which case it's a win-win because you get the better solution and you still get it at a cheaper price. I guess that uh, the, the solutions for, for spreadsheets, if I look at some of the software that I've used in the past and some of the software that I would need to, to do my business, uh, I do use spreadsheets now actually for, for various different things. The way I look at it, I guess, is that um, it, it, although they can be quite uh, detailed and quite uh, complicated, if, if you look at the day-to-day the -day operational side for um, small to medium businesses, the, it, it definitely plays a part there because you get a lot of clunky bits of software that will claim to do all singing and all dancing, but it becomes very, very difficult to actually use. Uh, and, and these big bits of software might have 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200 um, modules to it. Whereas uh, uh, an individual standalone solution can sometimes overcome the issues that they've got. So Richard, the, the thing that I'm interested in that you say that you uh, use formulas and not macros, and we all know that you can use both in Excel, um, but for those who don't maybe understand the difference between the two, could you just briefly explain that? Yeah, sure. Um, macros uh, are, is a visual basic programming language that you can write the back end of Excel. And whereas formulas are things that you put into the cells to determine the results. So if you open a normal Excel spreadsheet, all those little cells you see, you can type formulas in there to tell them what to do, or else you can actually reprogram Excel in a sense um, in order to, to write coding to be able to, to, do the, to do a similar thing. Now, someone like my brother, who's a computer programmer, would gravitate towards macros because that's what he knows. Whereas I would tend to go more towards formulas because that I've been using Excel and I'm better in Excel than I am in programming. People who are better in programming would tend to go mm -hmm. towards the macro side. But at the end of the day, it's, a, it's the same result, yes? In theory, yes, but not, not necessarily, because certain things you're trying to do, if you, if you go the macro route, I mean, for example, macros don't work on Excel online, macros don't work on uh, tablets and mobiles. Um, I often get called in to, do, to remake spreadsheets that have been done that have been quite macro heavy because the coding seems to just stop randomly from time to time. You have to, you have to reprogram bits. Um, so I could argue that a macro a macro a heavy macro driven spreadsheet is could possibly be uh a little bit more temperamental down the line than, than one that's not um and then also from a security point of view you know macros could be sending information out and in and doing all sorts of things that you don't know about whereas with a macro free spreadsheet they're far more secure okay excellent stuff so in terms of what what you provide I've, I've, I've had a look at your website and um you do do an awful lot of spreadsheets uh and cover a lot of different uh operational type scenarios whether that be uh the, the one person band or, or or a larger organization and i think you deal with individuals and organizations don't you so you do free pre-programmed, if you want to call it that, uh, spreadsheets, but also you do do bespoke uh, solutions as well. Yeah, I would say at the moment, 90% 90, 90 plus of my business is a bespoke solution. Um, the reason why I've done a lot of standard solutions is two reasons. Firstly, I think a lot of people don't know what's possible. They limit me to what they can do in Excel, um, whereas when they go online now and they find the standard solutions, if they find exactly what they want and they go, actually, that's what I'm looking for, then great, buy the one that's really made, it's, it's cheaper, it, it's ready to go, you can use it. Um, but I, I find often what happens is people will find those ones and then they'll contact me and they'll say, well, actually, I would like this one, but I want to do that, 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 and that. And then that at least is a very good starting point for me to be able to, to know what they need and start to create something for them. So personally, I use them more as a, as a lead in to the bespoke, um, but I've made them the standard products because, well, if that's what you want, then fine, they're done already, buy it. 
Um, but yeah, there's still most of my work is, is probably fair to sell or bespoke solutions. Okay. So with um, the spreadsheets that you do, I've seen some of the stuff on, on your website. Being on LinkedIn, I think what, what I'm surprised about to a degree is that anyone to start up a business as a spreadsheet solutions, it, it's, it's quite bold and quite brave. Was that something that you targeted on purpose or again, was it that you thought, well, okay, I'll give it a go on LinkedIn, see if there's a market there and it's just taken off from there? Cool. Um, no, it, it actually started when I was, the last job I had was the boss. My boss wasn't a particularly pleasant person. Um, and well, let's just say that he was, it was, it was all going downhill fast. And I was made redundant and not paid and all sorts of crazy things. Um, and I actually, uh, I was speaking to a friend of mine and um, trying to decide what to do next because I've, I've got so many, I had so many skills in all different aspects of business and I was trying to decide which one I wanted to use to, to go into my next field. And he, he said to me, well, if you won the lottery tomorrow and you didn't have to work because you had enough money, what would you do to keep yourself busy? And I thought about it for a while and I said, well, what I actually really enjoy is when I started a new job, I find them usually in a mess and I will sit down, structure everything, organize it all, build a spreadsheet to actually help manage now the, the new process and how it needs to be done. And once I've fixed the problem, so to speak, I tend to get a bit bored. Um, and I said, that's actually my favorite part of any new job is the first six months trying to get them straightened out. Once they're straightened out and it's running that clockwork, I get, you know, I get a bit bored. So he said, well, you know, it, would, is it fair to say that making spreadsheets is what you enjoy? And I said, yes, I, I love it. And he said, well, then why don't you do that? I was like, well, who's hiring people to do that? And he said, no, do that as your own business. And look, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Anyone who started a business will know this. I think in the first four years of, of running it, I probably threatened to quit 20, 30 times. Um, and, and there were times where I kind of beat myself up going, why are you doing this, you idiot? You could be earning a salary. Um, but I think a lot of hard work and determination paid off. I, I didn't necessarily see a market for this. I knew there would be. But it's difficult when no one else is doing it because, you know, if if there's a thousand accountants out there and you come and go, I'm an accountant like them, but I'm better, it's fairly easy to get into that market. Whereas when you're trying to create a new market that doesn't exist, it's quite difficult. And I think that's why I struggled so much. But now that I've overcome that, it, it's a lot easier now because people people see that that need now that they, that they know it exists. Okay, cool. You mentioned uh, earlier, uh, before you started your business, which is obviously we were going to touch on, because this is the Age Diversity Network podcast, that uh, you were made redundant. Did, did you find during your searching for roles after that particularly tough because you maybe weren't uh, uh, in the right age bracket, should we say? Um, I, I think we've, we've, we've seen this quite a lot and this is why age diversity network was originally set up that there are so many older workers out there that are finding it tough to either climb up the ladder maybe they don't want to but you know they've still got quite a few uh, miles left in them but but particularly i've seen definitely lately forget the pandemic prior pandemic as well um that the older workers are finding it more and more difficult to even get to the interview stage and it, it's something that I think has driven a lot of people into the area of starting their own business because either they've got no choice or it's the smart thing to do because they're slogging away day after day working but working to try and find work as against working to earn any money and the easiest option then becomes well okay what can I do for myself now how difficult did you find that it was that part of what pushed you to work for yourself uh, no, not really. I think the reason being was because, I mean, I don't know at what age people would necessarily start discriminating against people. But when I okay. when I finished when I finished that last job, I was uh, I was in my mid thirties, um, 
So I don't, I didn't necess, I didn't feel anything from that point of view. I think for me, I was just tired of working for people who a didn't appreciate it, and b. I don't want to say it was stupid because they weren't necessarily stupid, but they they didn't know how to run their own businesses put it that way. Um, and and I, I I just kind of thought well rather than jumping into another another employed position i wanted to be you know i wanted to control my own destiny from that point of view as far as possible now yes now the, the, the longer i stay in my own business the more i look at you know would there ever be a time afterwards where i go back into employment and now i'm looking from two points of view the more i've had my own business the more stubborn i become and i don't know if anyone would want to employ me um, but then the second thing is the older I get, the more, the less they want to employ you. And now that my age starts at the four rather than the three, um, I think it, it's probably going to just going to get harder from here, um, which I personally don't understand why people, I mean, when I first heard about age discrimination, um, I mean, I didn't, when, you know, when, when you're 22, you don't really know what's going on. You just, you know, you're rushing off doing your thing. When I first heard about it, I thought, I honestly thought that what they meant was that they weren't employing young people. Um, I, I never, the concept of not employing older people never really entered my mind because who would be stupid enough not to employ some with all of that experience? It just didn't make sense to me. Uh, I was quite shocked when I found out about it. But um, yeah, it, it didn't really play a, a part in, in me deciding to do my own business, but it, it def it's definitely on my mind now, yes. When we look at uh, age diversity, uh, if, if we look back, I don't know, 20, 30 years, maybe people had this um, picture in their head of uh, older workers or men and women in their 60s about to retire um and then it was affecting people definitely in their 50s and certainly beginning to creep into their 40s but now um there are people that are suffering in their late 30s and and it's, it's a tough one because the pandemic has not helped we all know that uh every everyone is suffering in terms of trying to gain work uh, they've been made redundant put on furlough um trying to get a new job from somewhere um so it crosses all ages <clears throat> but certainly in the the older brackets if you like the the one thing that uh, i've always found difficult to to understand is the amount of knowledge and skills that those older workers can bring to the table they're not all necessarily looking to become the senior person purely because they're older but what they are looking to do is to use the experience and the skills that they've gained over the last 20 to 30 years plus um, and put them to good use and other people can can uh, learn from that. And also the, the organization itself can gain so much. If you've got somebody who who's prepared with 30 to 40 years of experience, worked at a senior level, but to go in and say, look, you know, I'm not interested in running a department or, or being a senior manager or whatever. I'm just happy to come in and make a difference. I think somebody, some people find that a bit of a cliche and think, yeah, you don't really mean that. You're going to come in here um, and you're going to want to sort of tell us everything that we need to be doing. Maybe to a point, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, that they're going to try and take over. I think a lot of people, when they've got um, all that, that knowledge up here, they want to be able to use that and they want other people to learn from it. Plus, if you've, if you've gained that over, over so many years, um, isn't it wise to sort of understand that maybe somebody's been in a particular position before that the company or, or team finds themselves in and you might already have a, a, a good idea of what a solution might be? So it, it is tough. I don't, I don't think it's, it's definitely not uh, reserved for older people in their 50s and 60s. And I think the one thing that you said uh, is absolutely right. When you're young, when I was in my 20s, you know, I, I never thought about getting older. Um, you know, to me, you know, that they probably were oldies in my head. Uh, and, and that's just the way we think, unfortunately. Times have changed, however, which is good. Um, but I think it, it, it is getting tougher uh, in terms of being able to use that knowledge 
and get organizations to understand because often there'll be a number of things that, that will discount them. One may be your over experience. Another one might be um, it doesn't fit the culture. The thing is that not a lot of that will um, be fed back uh, to people that do uh, be lucky enough to, to even get to the interview stage because discrimination of any sort is always in the back of the minds of any employer. Uh, they need to be so careful and sometimes it's just better for them not to even go down the route of starting the interview. Uh, but different people but have over, different opinions. Overqualified, overqualified, and I've been told before that I was overqualified. Um, and to me, as a logical person, that makes zero sense. Because what you're effectively saying is you saying, you can't have this job because you're too good at it. That's what you're actually saying. And it's just, it's absolutely daft. I recently asked someone, um, what are the reasons for not employing an older person? Like, forget what's politically correct, forget what's legal, forget what, just tell me the truth. What are the reasons for not employing an older person? And everything that they told me, I said, well, is this always the case? It was, it was things like, well, they may want to progress or they may want a higher salary or they may want a senior role. And I'm going, but they may, they may, they may. An 18-year-old may want to progress. They may want a senior role. And they go, an older person may want to tell us what to do. I said, have you ever had a teenager? They're full of flipping nonsense. They think they know everything. So to be honest with you, all the things they said was, well, this comes down more to character type than it does to age. What if, and I said, as far as I'm concerned, if you put out a salary and go, I want to pay that amount of money and I want you to do this task, if a 20-year-old applies and a 50-year-old applies, and they're both prepared to do that task for that salary, why would you not want to have someone who's got more experience? I mean, yes, if you think they're taking it as, you know, this guy said, well, an older person may just be taking a role to, to buy time until they can get another more senior role. And I said, well, the youngster might be taking a role to get work experience to go and apply for another role. Wh whatever, there's always going to be issues. This is why you have interviews. But just to blindly refuse anybody who's over a certain age because they're overqualified, what you're actually saying is, I want someone who's got less experience because I want to tell them what to do because I don't really know what I'm doing and I don't want them to question it. That's, I think, what it often comes down to. I mean, if, if I were to employ someone and I got the opportunity to employ someone with more experience, I'd take it. Uh, I think yeah. that, that's very true because one of the things that I often see is, is there is that fear of uh, the hiring manager or the departmental manager who is doing the actual recruiting. Um, and th this isn't a blanket statement, but obviously there are a number of people out there that do suffer from it, which is exactly what you said. If I get someone in who's got a lot more experience than me, and in a way it shows that I'm inferior to them, that's actually quite short-sighted because they should be grasping that as an opportunity to say, here's someone I can learn from. Uh, and, and I think anyone who who has any doubts about people passing that knowledge on needs to step back and, and have a real good think about that because uh, I think uh, anyone who is good at what they do generally will try and teach others because not only does it help the other person, but it actually shows how good you are too. I went to a job interview in the UK, this was a number of years back, and uh, they gave me an Excel test to do to see if I was as good as what I said on my CV. And halfway through the test, I discovered a fault with their test. So I pointed it out to them and explained why it had happened and why they should have possibly done the test slightly differently to what they did. And you could visibly see their reaction and you could see, I could see that their perception of me changed straight away. And all of a sudden the interview was cut short and I was sent an email to saying that I was overqualified. And I'm going, so you'd rather continue with mistakes than actually learn and overcome those because you don't want to admit that, that you made a mistake and learn from it. And I, I suspect that overqualified was because they didn't like to be told that what they'd done was wrong or could have or not necessarily wrong but what could have been done better and and i think that plays a part but people won't admit that so they 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 write it off to being overqualified because it's an, it's an easy out i think that's absolutely yeah. true because that again there are people that they have that fear that it's going to show them up it's going to show how inferior they are and, and they've just got to get past that but you know it's it's, it's the world we live in it's a, a huge struggle and i think a lot of it isn't necessarily down to 
the changes that we can make. A lot of it is down to individuals uh, because if they're if they're of a certain nature, they just won't change. But it's, it's it, it is about education and it's about understanding what's on offer um, and what value can be brought in by by at least considering those sort of people. So, yeah. but that's that's interesting to, to to hear that from you. I think what you do, would you say that from a from a business perspective, because obviously you weren't sure whether there was a market for spreadsheet, you've stuck at it for quite a few years uh, and definitely proved that there is. What what was the biggest challenge that you say you would have faced? You know, forget the I'm not earning enough or this sort of thing, but in, in a business sense, what would you say would was your biggest challenge? There were lots. I I don't think there was one particular challenge which proved to be the biggest. I think what made it such a such a difficult journey was the fact that there were rather than one big hurdle, there were three hundred little hurdles, and all those little hurdles <laughs> took their toll. Um, I've recently written a book um, called Forty Facets of Starting and Growing a Business," and what I've done is I've broken it down into forty chapters, and those are forty different areas of business. And I'm, I'm talking about all sorts of things, from marketing through to designing a logo, through to accounting and working from home, all sorts of categories. And I think in each of those categories, I have learn something over the last seven years and when you work for a company and you're employed and you go to self-employed you start a business because you want to do a particular thing i started a business because i want to make spreadsheets but yet all the other stuff that goes with starting a business no one told me about marketing no one told me about account no one told me that you have to issue an invoice to get paid and that invoice has to have certain things on it do you register for that don't you what kind of business do you register how do you market? Who's your ideal client? How do you design a logo? What's it like working from home? How are you going to do it? All those things, it just hits you when you start and you kind of go, hang on a second, I've got to do all of this now. Um, you can't just pitch up to work, do your nine to five, go home and your salary's in your account at the end of the month. It doesn't work like that anymore. And I think all those different things, when I talk about them now, it sounds overwhelming, but because I've gone through it, it's now kind of second nature the way I, I do things. But all those little things, trying to overcome all of that has been difficult. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I wanted to have a resource available for other people to pick it up, learn from my mistakes, see what they need to be dealing with, and go in with a much better view than what I did when I started. I mean, I don't regret starting, but I do regret starting a little bit more unprepared than what I should have. One of the issues... For, for starting a business and you see it every day and definitely on LinkedIn, there are thousands of experts in the same field and it's very, very difficult also to know which ones to go to. And I think that maybe, maybe one of the, uh, the things definitely is, is networking with people you know, but, it, but it's interesting to see, I, I had noticed actually uh, before we uh, were chatting today that you had written that book. So is that something that people can get from your website or, or wherever? Uh, yes, that? it's, I've actually got a, I've got a paperback version that arrived the other day, so mm -hmm. it's it's on the website. Um, it's available in Kindle, PDF, and paperback. It was quite strange because I'm not actually an author. In fact, I can honestly say that I've written more books this year than I've read. So I'm not even a reader. In fact, if this book was available before I started my business, I probably wouldn't have read it anyway. But because I've learned so much and I've learned all these things, I don't, I'm not an expert in, you know, there's, there are 40 chapters in this book, all dealing with 40 different things. I might be an expert in two of these chapters, if that. The rest of them aren't things I'm an expert in, but it's things that I've been through and it's things that I've made mistakes. And I want to point out to people, listen, I'm not telling them what to do. I'm saying this is the mistake I made. This is what you should look out for. Now you make your own call and hopefully give, give people enough insight into each of those chapters that they can either take it further and do more research or make a decision to at least do something based on what I've got there. It's never been a money-making thing. It's never been a passion of mine to write a book. It was more out of necessity of, actually, I don't want someone else wasting many years making the same mistakes I made. Let's put something out there that, that helps them to you know, maybe get further ahead on the road than, than where I started. It's quite refreshing that, that there's a book like that and you've decided to write it that way because often people will find it tough to know which books to buy because those books will often have this is what you must do and how you must do it and have the solution. Whereas what you're saying then if I'm understanding this correctly is you're not necessarily saying I have the solution to all of these 40 issues. 
in these 40 chapters, what you're saying is, these are the problems that I came across and these are the things you need to think about. And if you don't know the answers yourself, then go seek the expertise that you do need from somewhere else, but at least take these into consideration if you're starting a business. It's quite a nice angle. So yeah, that, that would be interesting. That would be interesting to read. So, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll obviously give people the, the details of how they can get this stuff um, at, at the end of the, the podcast. In terms of your business, we've spoken before about how people, when they're job seeking, I use spreadsheets, lots of other people use spreadsheets. We create our own columns and then we put a formula in and think, oh, damn, I've got to go change that one now. So I think in terms of the solutions that you offer, when we spoke, the people that were actually looking for work, you do have a particular spreadsheet that uh, logs the job searches and other pertinent information, follow-ups and when you spoke to somebody in notes, etc. And you kindly offered to make that freely available, uh, which is very kind of you, to uh, members of the Age Diversity Network. So um, what we'll do again at the end of the, the podcast, we'll give the details of, of how people can, can get hold of this stuff. So I just wanted to give a shout out and thank you very much for doing that. That's very kind of you. I think one of the things that uh, people do struggle with. I've yeah. never actually used that spreadsheet because I made it after I was part of my own business. I've never used it to search for jobs myself. But I know in the past I've missed out on jobs because I haven't followed up and I've forgotten about them. And it, I mean, some I've seen people on LinkedIn saying they've applied for thousands of jobs. I mean, how do you possibly manage that? So I, I wanted to make something to help job seekers i mean they've got enough on their plates as it is and there's enough stress you don't want to add more so anything that can help along the way i'm, I'm more than happy to do so so yeah it's a pleasure Excellent. i will make it a point of downloading it and i'll i'll check it out and i'll let you know yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's fantastic so in terms of your business then so you've been going what four four or is it seven years sorry seven years seven years so during that time uh and the answer is probably going to be many but but if i was to say to you okay what would you say would be your single biggest achievement that, that you would say I'll, i'm going to give myself a pat on the back for that one i, I don't know i'm i don't want this to sound negative but it probably will come across negative i'm not necessarily I'm a lot harsher on myself than I am on other people. I find it very, very difficult to to say to myself, "Well done, you've you've done a good job." I'm I'm quite I'm quite driven from the sense of, yes, yeah, yes, you've doubled your turnover from last year, but why haven't you tripled the kind of thing? You know that that that's my mentality. It keeps me going, and I think even just looking back over my life, what what am I? What, if you look, if I look back twenty years, twenty years ago, if you said to me, "Would you start your own business?" I would have said, "No, I'm too scared to do that." And twenty years ago, you said to me, "Would you immigrate, pitch up in a country that you've never been to before to live and not have a job?" I would say, "There's no ways I would do that." I've immigrated twice, and I've started my own business. So from those things, I've I've overcome a lot of things that I've needed to overcome to get to where I am now. We've suffered a lot of financial hardship to get to this point, a lot of frustration, a lot of all sorts of negative things. And I see the whole thing as an achievement because I, I try not to look at any individual thing, like even writing a book. A lot of people have gone, wow, you wrote a book that's amazing. Well, I don't think it is that amazing. I just wrote it, put it up on Amazon, there it is. But if I look at all of that together, and go well 20 years ago i was there now i'm here I've, look at what i've achieved i think that is quite notable and, and that whole the whole kind of package deal as it was i'm proud of, of, of what i've achieved but I, I don't necessarily see individual things as hurdles there's no you know one night i won this award kind of thing that that stands out as the major achievement i think it's, it's all that hard work and and everything I mean, I don't know what percentage it is of businesses that go out of business in the first five years. I think it's quite high. And just even just to be not one, not to be one of those, I think is, is an achievement. So the whole thing, really, I would say. I think it's one of those things that um, certainly if you're working for yourself, each achievement is an achievement in itself. And it doesn't matter how big or how small. I think just surviving um, is often an achievement in itself uh, without sort of going to the next level then the next level and the next level and, and i suppose it also depends on people's drivers uh what they're they're really looking to achieve well whether you're looking to achieve a multi-million pound business in the future whether that's a target or whether that's something that'd be great if it happened but if it didn't and providing i can survive then that's good enough so it, it's interesting just to get different perspectives from from different people 
Um, well, so. to Mike, if I, if I can just say, I, I had a chat with a, a young guy a number of months back who phoned me up and just said he was just, you know, wanted to ask a few questions because he'd started his own business and he's not making the kind of money he thought and blah, blah, blah. And I, I chatted to him for a while and then I said to him, how long have you been in business? And he said, four months. I said, four months? This takes time. And what I think a lot of business owners do is they have these, and I, I did exactly the same. You've got these mindsets of grandeur that you know you, you're gonna you're gonna make a website, put it live, and all of a sudden you're gonna be a multi-millionaire. It doesn't work like that. Maybe for the odd person, but for the majority it doesn't. And I think what people often do is they they start with these massive ideas and then it doesn't quite work out and then they collapse. Whereas I started with very little expectation. And I've just grown and every year it's grown and every year it's grown and every year I'll look at it and go, am I doing better than I was last year? If the answer is yes, keep going. Um, if the answer is no, that, that doesn't necessarily mean quit, but it means why not? What can I change? What can I do differently? And I think if you're looking for instant success, you're going to be disappointed. Whereas if you just keep growing on what you've got, keep building, keep building, keep improving, keep doing it better than what you were before, over the years, you'll see if you look back a number of years, you'll see where you are now compared to where you were. But I think nowadays, especially with the whole, you know, McDonald's drive through kind of mentality, you want it, you want it now. And it doesn't happen like that. Because very, very true. I think it is, it's a long game. If people succeed in a very short space of time, you could say it's lucky they're in the right place at the right time or what have you. But Generally speaking, yes, you've got to put the effort in and it does happen over time. So I think we're going to have to bring this to a close, Richard, but I think I think we could talk for a long time, but unfortunately we are a little bit limited. So Richard, uh, with all the solutions that you, you have on offer, uh, and I'm sure there's lots there that people would be interested in, what's the best way for anyone to contact you or, or find out what you do? The best way would be the website, richardsolutions.biz, richardsolutions, one word, .biz. Um, all the contact links are there, um, but I am very active on LinkedIn. Um, in fact, I would imagine in the next few months, LinkedIn may well be the only social media platform where I actually actively market because I think the other ones aren't doing what they ought to be. But yeah, the, the website's usually the best place to start because all my contact details are there and there's all sorts of examples and things. So it's usually the best place to do. Fantastic. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that for anyone that's watching, it will be on the screen and for the podcast, it will be at the end of the podcast. They'll be able to see that on the thumbnail. I think certainly if people are looking to start their own business and are worried about high software costs, then then the solutions that you, you have on offer certainly would be a good start for them. So uh, thanks ever so much for that. Well, it, it's been a real pleasure, Richard and uh, a, a different type of podcast and great to speak to you to, to know what you do and I think of how people can certainly benefit from the different types of solutions so the best thing we can do really is ask people just to go to the website have a look and I'm pretty sure if, if there's something there that they think might fit or not then just contact you anyway and gladly have a chat with them. Always I mean I, I occasionally get people contact me just ask me questions about the standard products and what they can do I'm always at the other end of the phone so just give me a call and uh... I'm, I'm happy to help. No, that's really great, Richard. And thank you ever so much. It's been a real pleasure to have you on. And uh, again, for anyone listening, the details of how to contact Richard will be on the thumbnail of the podcast. So Richard, for now, thank you. And I wish you well. Thank you. Bye. If you are affected by age diversity issues at work or are experiencing problems seeking employment, and believe that your age is a barrier or if you are an inclusive employer who actively embraces the older worker and are interested in the services and help we can offer then please contact us at www.agediversitynetwork.com or simply follow us on LinkedIn.